Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, we're in this series about what would Jesus do, seeking to ask questions um, in our culture today. Would Jesus do anything differently than he did when he was walking the earth 2,000 years ago. And so last Sunday morning, uh, I was having a quiet time and I came across a quote from Presbyterian pastor, Dr. Charles McGowan. And when I first read it, I kind of, ah, that's good. And, and then the more I thought about it, the more I went, man, that is good. In fact, look at it, I wanna show you this. He says this, our theology is like a skeleton. It's a necessary foundation, but it's the only thing visible about our faith. We are malnourished or dead. If our theology, what we believe or what we don't believe is the only thing the world out there sees, then what they see is a malnourished or dead faith. And so what we've been wanting to do over the last few weeks is we've been wanting to hang some flesh on the bones of theology. Because see, I believe that, that Jesus did that. When he came, he put flesh on the bones of theology, that God is love, that God is after us. And he loved sinners and addicts and adulterers and sexual deviants. And he respected women and, and valued children and, and rejected stoic religion and theology without any flesh. He hung flesh on love. He hung flesh of love on the theology, the skeleton, so to speak, of who God is. And you see, I believe the key to success is not just to know God's word, and we should, because I believe we should have a strong skeleton, amen, amen. of what we believe, but I really believe God's called us to live it. In fact, Joshua chapter one, verse eight says this, this book of the law shall not depart out of my mouth, but I shall meditate on it day and night. And here is why having a good skeleton of theology is so important that we meditate on that and we know the skeletal structure of what God is and who God is and what God does. Yet here is the reason we do it. Look at the second half. That we may be careful to do, everybody say to do. To do according to all that is written in it. And then you shall have what? Good Say it again, good what? Success. That word's only used three times in the Old Testament. It's only used three times in the Old Testament, success. And it's tied to meditating on the word of God and doing it. Now think about that for a minute. That's good, isn't it? You see, theology matters. Love matters. And if we pit them against each other, as if only one or the other really matters, it distorts them both. And that's why this summer we've been, we've been looking at hanging some flesh on some theology and, and looking at some of these things that, that maybe you've never heard talked about in church. In fact, if you were here last Sunday, you probably never heard a sermon on tattoos and then we hung flesh on it with Brandon. <laughs> you may come from a background like I did that said, just preach the gospel. If you'll preach the gospel, it'll solve everything. The problem with that is... <laughs> Look at what Ray Ortland said. He said this, just preach the gospel and you don't need to address other issues. I disagree. That approach, though nobly intended, allows burning issues to go unaddressed. Flagrant wrongs uncorrected and needed apology silence. And I love this statement that he said, let's press the gospel into the whole of our lives. And let's not be afraid of those things. The tension of the judgments if you remember three weeks ago, we all have judgments, don't we? I have them. And maybe it's the more I read or the older I get or the more honest I am or the more convicted I am of my dislike and lack of people and things. So there's some people I just don't like. I know. 
probably never heard a preacher say that, have you? But we all have them, don't we? And get this, I said this a couple weeks ago, we even have a limit to our grace. We want all the grace in the universe shown to us, but we'll quickly run out of grace when it comes to others. Bob Goff said this this last week, I'm reminded again how grace never seems fair until you need some. Isn't that good? Grace never seems fair until you need it. And so many times I'll justify my judgments just by validating my theology, my bones. I'll rattle the bones a little bit, you know, and I'll silence them. So we've been looking at some of these things that Jesus may or may not have done. And when you think about sin, because some people classify everything as sin and some people classify nothing as sin. And yet there's really two kinds of sins in scripture when you look at it. There's a universal sins and those are those things that the Bible condemns for all people, all cultures, all times. Sexual immorality, idolatry, adultery, prostitution, homosexuality, theft, drunkenness, greed, slander, swindling. If you need a list, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9, and 10, okay? Because that's where the scripture, that's where we get that list from. The central elements of most television, Netflix, and, and, and uh, all those shows we watch, amen? amen? Those are universal sins, but then there's those particular sins. And those are those offenses that are sinful for some people under some circumstances, but not for all people under all circumstances. You see, all of us are commanded by God to avoid universal sins. That's not up for debate. That's called being a follower of Jesus Christ, an imitator of Jesus Christ. But we're also commanded by God to avoid sins that are particular to us. Jesus said, if your right arm calls you to sin, cut it off. If your eye calls you to sin, poke it out. Those are those particular sins that some of us have to remove out of our journey. The problem is we must do so without unfairly condemning and restricting the freedoms of fellow Christians who involve themselves in other controversial cultural matters. And sometimes what we'll do is we'll, instead of just giving people freedom in the particular sense, we'll just name nothing a sin. Or we'll just do how I grew up and say, don't do anything, right? Anybody grew up in that culture? We're just gonna ban everything, all fun. Even so far as dominoes, <laughs> cards, yeah, okay, I'll stop. So let's review. Over the last two weeks, we, we asked the question, what would Jesus do? Would Jesus drink alcohol? Two weeks ago, we asked, or three weeks ago, we asked that question. And two weeks ago, we looked at what Jesus would do. Would Jesus get a tattoo? And, and we looked at the biblical, scriptural look at what does Scripture say about cultural issues that we're facing today? Not what your mama said, not what your denomination said, maybe not what your family said or your influence or where you grew up or what generation you grew up in. What does the Scripture say? And then last week, we hung some flesh on that tattoo thing of Brandon Brown. We call him uh, Bandana Brandon. If you miss that, you need to carve out about 30 five minutes and go and listen to that and hear his story about how God is still using him. The brother is covered in tats and now we love him and what God is doing in his journey. And today I want to hang some flesh on the bones of theology when it comes to alcohol. And let me say this, our desire in teaching a right theology and hanging some flesh on those bones is not so that you'll drink. <laughs> It's not even that you would go get a tattoo because I know absolutely there are many in this room that will never drink and never get a tattoo and that is okay. But what we do want to do is address these cultural issues from a scriptural point of view and then love those who may differ in the application of those particular things and not be so quick to pass judgment. I love what Brandon said last week from the day he walked into this place. If you don't know who I'm talking about, Brandon has tattoos from here to here. Nothing up here. I mean, he does have something up here, but no tats. <laughs> Doesn't have tats on his thighs and covered from his knees down. He said, the day I walked into Summit Heights, I was never judged once. Way to go, Summit. That's what I love about you. But I also know that I have some family members when it comes to alcohol that because they've had a bad experience like some of you have had, is that they just don't want to be anywhere near it. And I get it. I get that. And I don't ever want to practice my freedoms at the expense of their belief. And so I want to hang some flesh on that. But before we do, let's review in case you missed it. Or maybe you hadn't listened online. Because I think we can all agree that having a glass of wine or a beer is different than being drunk. Amen? Okay? Because here's some biblical prohibi uh, prohibitions against drunkenness. I want to throw these up again. I showed you three weeks ago. Number one, drunkenness is a sin. 
I didn't say drink, a drink is a sin. I didn't say having a glass of wine with your steak is a sin. I said drunkenness is a sin because the scripture says drunkenness is a sin. Scripture says no priest was to drink alcohol while performing his duties. Though he could consume it while not working. No king was to drink while judging law. An elder or pastor can't be a drunkard. And no drunkard will inherit the kingdom of God. And then we know that what drunkenness leads to, look at this next diagram that we showed you this last week, a couple weeks ago, that biblical problems caused by drunkenness and all these things that the scripture lists. And you can take a picture of that if you want to and go study it for yourself. And you can see those things. So I want to establish that, hey, drinking has its issues. And I think all Bible-believing Christians agree that drunkenness is a sin. And it causes a life of misery. And, and let me go ahead and address the teenage issue in the room because you may be a teenager in this room. And, and I'll tell you why we never address this from a biblical standard because we were scared to death that kids would then run wild in the streets, right? So he said, it's evil. And be careful calling evil what God doesn't call evil. And so we never addressed it. And so for the teenagers in this room, if you're listening to me, I don't care if your mom and daddy said it's natural. I don't care if your mom and daddy said it's okay. Scripture, when we say that you can drink when you're underage, what that means is you're violating another principle that we are under the law of our land. And we're to honor the law of our land. And so if you're drinking under the age of 21, you are breaking a law in the land. And it is a sin. Did you hear that? You can't usurp this principle for this one. And so I want to say to everybody in this room that's under the age of 21, if you're drinking, it's a sin if you're a Christian. And parents, you need to weigh that and be wise. See, here's what I believe. And, and, and I believe that Christianity has no longer become the think tank of our culture because we quit thinking. We quit looking at scripture and wrestling it down to the ground of what God says about it. And we've got to become thinkers. And so a few weeks ago, we looked at God gave wine. Kenneth Gentry Jr. says this. He gave three views of drinking alcohol common to Bible-believing Christians. Number one is prohibitionists that wrongly teach that drinking is a sin and that alcohol itself is a sin. He then talked about those who are abstinence-based. That basically wrongly teaches that drinking not, is not sinful, but that all Christians should avoid drinking out of love for others. Well, you ought to avoid overeating too. You ought to avoid speeding too, amen? Okay? So that doesn't work. That the biblical view is a moderation, is rightly teaching that drinking is not a sin, and that each person must let Christian conscience guide them without judging others. You see, the Bible talks about there are common occasions to drink alcohol in moderation. We showed them to you three weeks ago. Celebration, you can find it in Scripture. Celebration of the Lord's Supper medicinal purposes, worship, thanksgiving to God, happiness. And so we established two, three weeks ago that we believe that drinking is not a sin, but it is in a moderation. And I know that some of you in this room, you have had a terrible experience with it. And we want to honor you in that. And we want to support you in that and build you up in that. We would never want to do anything that would cause you to stumble. And at the same time, we also want to honor the scripture and God's word. And what does God's word say? And not judge those that believe differently than we do. Amen? So now that we've established our theology of moderation, based on scripture, not your mama, not your denomination, not your upbringing, but a biblical view of alcohol. Last Friday, we went over to Tyler and we met with a new friend of mine. And uh, several years ago in a Bible study in a small group, something happened that that, that honestly in the Bible Belt of East Texas is pretty stinking cool. And so I, I want to introduce you to him, but um, I want to say this to you. I, don't leave because you need to hear this story. And you, you, you're honestly going to walk out of here today and unless you grew up Catholic or unless you grew up whiskey, pay, uh, pencil paying, <laughs> you've probably never heard this from the stage about what you're about to hear. And I want to hang some flesh on our theology. So watch this video and I want to introduce him to you. My name is Ryan Dixon, owner, founder of True Vine Brewing Company, Tyler, Texas. We are five years strong and we're loving what we're doing.
we here at Truvine believe that beer can be a great equalizer. Um, no matter where you come from, your background, what you look like, how much money you have in your pocket, um, there's something special about having real conversations around the beer. Um, and you can do that right here at Truvine. We love it um, from small families to, to older folks. Um, it's really neat to see really the, the cultures collide. Core values are integrity, community, love, doing everything to the best of our ability no matter who's watching, involving our community and giving back as much as possible, and love, loving one another is what we're all called to do. Yeah, I told you, didn't I? Hey, would you welcome Ryan Dixon to the stage? I'll give him a hand. Amen. I got to meet Ryan this last week. Ryan and I have a great mutual friend that I went to college with, and uh, we've been keeping track. He's a pastor over at uh, Grace Community Church in Tyler, where Ryan and his wife Tracy and their kids attend, and uh, uh, had been following them from a distance for years uh, because I have young children. I told him this morning we don't venture to Tyler very often, so uh, now that our kids are getting old enough, we might can venture out because we can leave them at home. Man. So... Uh, <laughs> Ron, thank you for being here. It's a long uh, ways from home, though. It I, is a I long way. It's yeah. 45 minutes. It, it is yeah, a long way. Yeah. Um, so, Ryan, I, I know your wife, Tracy, and you've got two daughters and a son. They're here with you this morning. Sure. I'm so glad you guys are here yeah, this morning. This is awesome. It's already been encouraging to be here uh, to see some, uh, some vibrance. Man, yeah. Vibrant church. It's a, it's a cool place. Very cool. So, Ron, tell us your story. Uh, how, you know, where did you grow up? How, when did you get saved? How did your journey of coming to Christ? And then how in the stinking world did you get into brewing? Okay. Well, good. Um, so, once again, Ryan Dixon uh, from Tyler, Texas. I was actually born in a um, Good Shepherd Hospital in Longview when I was a tiny tot, obviously. Um, lived there in East Texas for a few years. My dad was going to Bible college and uh, working at Laterno University. Uh, was called to the ministry and um, moved to Virginia. So at age four, we uh, packed a, a moving van. And I remember, literally, I remember visually like sitting next to him uh, in the moving van, even at that young age. Um, I had a lot of great conversations uh, with, my, with my parents as, as I grew up and accepted Christ really early on uh, in my life. I recognized early that um, I was in need of a Savior. My life was full of sin uh, just because of the nature uh, of humanity. Um, and then from there, um, just kind of grew up in the woods and the creeks of Virginia, beautiful Virginia. And um, my dad was a pastor there for nine years, so grew up a, a, a PK, a pastor's kid. Any other PKs in the house? Right. Got a couple right there okay. on the front. So, uh. <laughs> um, so it was, it was an uh, independent Baptist church, um, so that mm. was my background, my upbringing. Um, from there, uh, around 14 years old, my dad uh, picked up a job in Lubbock, West Texas. Anybody know where that is? <laughs> out in the desert. So from the mountains and the trees and the streams to the desert, right? Um, <laughs> so we moved uh, to, to Lubbock, Texas. My dad was uh, a manager of a Christian radio station out there. Once again, we're still uh, in the, the, the independent Baptist world growing up. Um, from there, high school, junior high, high school, college age, I started to lose my identity in Christ, so to speak. I started to um, wonder why I couldn't do the things that, that I was told not to do. And so some of you guys may have experienced uh, a season of rebellion, and that prodigal son mm. story became very real to me. Um, experienced 
uh, some, some years of just struggle, and the whole time I knew that God was just waiting patiently, as our Heavenly Father does. He waits patiently for his kids to return uh, with a couple smacks upside the face. Um, and you guys probably know what I'm talking about, those who have been in that role. Um, he really got a hold of my life um, from there. Um, 180 degree, repent. Lord, I need to come back. I, I, need, I need you. I know that my life without you is, is empty. So uh, at that time, uh, I was going to a church there with my family, mostly to just make my parents happy, um, but uh, I knew it was the right place to be. I met this um, wonderful, beautiful young lady uh, who was a PK uh, at that church, uh, the <laughs> pastor's kid um, at, at our church. Her name is Tracy, and she is my wife today. Um, and um, she was going through a rough patch, too. And we both kind of recognized it in each other's lives and kind of set out to be good friends. Uh, from there, developed a, a beautiful friendship um, that I tried to protect as much as possible, even to the point where I broke up with her before we were even dating, because I didn't want to jeopardize our friendship. That's how crazy I was about that. Um, but she was right and I was wrong. And, uh, wait, wait, hang on. <laughs> Tracy, you want to get your phone out and record that? Yeah. Say that one more time. She was right. Okay. <laughs> Still is right. Um, and fell in love and really sought the Lord together. Uh, was involved in youth ministry for a while. Um, got involved in audio engineering. That's my background. Love that stuff. And then from there, got married um, and um, had a beautiful daughter named Addison. And, um, and then from there, about two seconds later, we found out we were pregnant again with uh, number two. And uh, at that time, uh, my parents and her parents uh, had moved back to their homeland, if you will. And so we were out there all by ourselves and didn't have a lot of friends that were having babies, so we kind of freaked out. And with that, we wanted our kids to grow up near family. Uh, I saw how valuable it was to my wife. Uh, to grow up near grandparents and uncles and aunts and cousins, and I didn't get that privilege when I was mm. younger. So we took a, a leap of faith to come out to East Texas. Uh, we both left pretty, pretty decent jobs behind because we just felt the Lord calling us to be here. And um, as soon as we got here, we wondered why the heck we left. <laughs> <laughs> it was just trials. You know, you guys have experienced, like, God, you've called me to do this. Now <laughs> you've kind of left me abandoned, or so we think. Yeah. And so we spent some years doing that. Uh, we opened a coffee shop and a recording studio in Quitman, Texas. Your neighbor, right? It's called Studio Java, and so it was coffee shop by day and recording studio by night. Cool. Uh, we'd we'd uh, be holding our babies, making a latte, or we'd give you our baby and we'd make the <laughs> latte. <laughs> How bad do you want that latte? <laughs> <laughs> a little swing in the back. With the, um, so we tried to make life happen and really just waited for the Lord to show up. Um, we, uh, long story short, we finally were able to understand why uh, we were able to spend the last couple of years of um, Tracy's dad's uh, life with him. He passed away a few years ago, mm -hmm. and we were in the, in, uh, the midst of him for years and years. And it was just a very healing thing. And that's really the, the culmination, I think, of why, why the Lord told us to come out here is to spend those, those valuable years yeah. with someone that we consider uh, a great influence. Yeah. Uh, so from there, work jobs here and there, um, and then uh, moved to Tyler, Texas. And that's where we live now. Um, and uh, then I started getting into craft beer, just really... The, the, the creation side of things, the artistry, I love that. I've always loved that. I think it's been a bend for me, even as a young child. I remember a, a literal Mr. Rogers neighborhood. You all know what I'm talking about, Mr. Rogers. Did, um, he, did he have a deal on brewing? He didn't have a deal on brewing. Okay, I, I was like, but it gets I don't there. remember that. Yeah, um, it, it does, it uh, does, the story does go there. Um, I remember he was talking about colors and crayons, and then he, uh, as he often would in the show, he would show a factory in the neighborhood, or yeah. he said it was in the neighborhood, who knows. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, Probably across the country. <laughs> it was a little toy factory yeah, um, of, of a crayon factory, and how they'd melt the wax, and they put mm -hmm. it in the little trays, and 
And then they'd wrap it, and, and it was just so cool. And I remember even at that age thinking how cool it would be to have a factory one day. And, um, and I've always been get kind of bent towards the creative side. And so the creation of craft beer really intrigued me. So I got into home brewing, uh, just brewing uh, small batches of beer in, in uh, our house. The first beer I ever brewed was a, an oatmeal stout. And uh, it was great, and I'm an obsessive, compulsive kind of person. Mm. And so if I get involved in something, that's all I think about. Anybody else? <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, I was a skateboarder when I was a teenager, and that's all I did. That's all I thought about. That's you all you I still have the skating hair, by the way. Yeah, the hair good, still good. looks good. So. It's that rebel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, from there, I uh, got into home brewing, and then um, one of my cousins uh, recommended a book to me, and then the rest is history. <laughs> so talk a little bit about that book, and, and I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, yeah, you have this fascination with brewing and factory. How'd you get from audio engineer to this? Y'all were involved in a church, is that right, over there? Kind of talk that process through with those guys. Um, so audio engineering or engineering background at all, any of you guys and gals in the audience that have that kind of a brain, you're always trying to figure out point A to point B, how to solve problems, and then you take the creativity side to it and add it, a little bit of a funky twist to it. So I think it, um, I think it all really does fit in together because you have multiple ingredients um, or multiple pipes or whatever, electrical engineering, multiple circuits. Uh, that all work together to create a process or a product. Um, so it was a pretty natural transition. Uh -huh. uh, I love to cook. I love to grill. You'll see me on Sunday evenings with the family grilling uh, food. And that's just kind of one of our releases, if you will, one of the things that we enjoy doing. And so um, home brewing and brewing and process, uh, the whole process, I think, really ties into all of that. I still love music. It's still a big part of uh, my life, and it's a big part of what Truvine does today at our facility. We uh, host music events and have a stage and all that kind of stuff. So big tension here, big yeah. tension, because I grew up Southern Baptist. You grew up Independent Baptist. That's a little bit north of Southern Baptist. And um, <laughs> so you and I have a Baptist background. Your mm -hmm. dad's a pastor. Tracy's dad's a pastor. If you grew up Southern Baptist, you know all alcohol is sin, right? How's that working for you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, how, how, I mean, what was the tension there for that? I think, I think it's, what were we taught? What were we, what were our influences? And so I started to challenge that a little bit early on. Uh, when I was getting into craft beer. And like I mentioned, there, there's a book that kind of changed my perspective on it. Um, it's called The Search of God in Guinness. Um, <laughs> the Search of God in Guinness. This is good. Y'all yeah, need yeah. to hear this. This is really good. So um, it is a biography about the Guinness family. I'm sure you guys have heard the, the name Guinness, Guinness Book of World Records, um, Guinness the Beer, the Dark um, Irish Stout. Um, I read the book and was truly inspired. It shows that this family, the Guinness family, was hardcore for Christ. Um, they, they loved people, and they wanted to do something about it. So there's basically, in a long story short, there's three different groups of Guinnesses. There's the banking side of Guinnesses. There's uh, the brewing side of Guinnesses. And then there's the pastoral side of the Guinness family. And uh, so I read this book, and it kind of goes through the history of them and, you know, the dates and all this kind of stuff. And uh, the part that, of course, intrigued me the most were the brewing and the pastoral side of this family. So Guinness was brewing beer back in um, mid-1800s over there in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, they were doing a good job. They were creating a product that was very unique, very new to um, the, that, the beer world, so to speak. Um, and they were doing a great job with it. Uh, the way that they were processing and getting the water and all of that was super fascinating from the, the engineering, the brewing side, um, which was neat. But I think the thing that really moved me um, was the fact that they cared for their people. Uh, they 
um, the Guinness family were so extreme about their love for their neighbor that they put flesh on the skeleton. They um, saw around them Dublin, Ireland, mid-1800s, was considered a third world country, um, very disease-stricken, very much poverty, no education. 33% um, of the population um, lived with uh, at least 10 people in one room, um, no no uh, electricity. I mean, it's just mm. bad stuff. Yeah. And of course, no electricity. That was a bad example. Um, <laughs> and they, they saw that the world around them was falling apart. And they knew that it wasn't going to be that guy over there or the politician over there. They knew that if someone was going to do it, it was going to be them. And so they took um, drastic measures to hire a doctor to go door to door. It took them two and a half years to um, mm. assess the situation. They reported back saying, hey, right around 1900, hey, this is the situation, this is my recommendation. And uh, they didn't just say, cool, thanks for the information. They did something about it. And uh, that was that. huge. Imagine that. was that. huge. Yeah. They, they um, created all new housing development so that everybody would move out of their dilapidated housing, move into that. Um, and then tear that down and build a new one. That was their mission. They cared that much. It's uh, pretty intense. And so those kind of things, and then, of course, the heartbeat of what they were doing was, was very real. They considered their jobs not a meaningless job to make beer, but a, a, an act of service, an act of worship uh, for the creator. And so back to your question, um, you know, I grew up in a, in a background, in an era where they had just come from, um, you know, prohibition and the, the extreme alcohol problem that truly mm -hmm. plagued America for yeah. years and years. And um, so it was natural to, to hear that information and to believe that information. And the more I got into things like that, I, I read this book and start to question and ponder a little bit more about church history and beer. And the more and more that I dug into it, the more and more I realized that church and beer were never separated until really our generation and the generations before us. Um, early church history, um, beer is a very common thing. Um, they were the brewers back in the early church. Yeah. And so that kind of thing just kind of sparked some interest with me. And I remember talking to um, my wife Tracy at that time and, and really pondering if we could do a fraction of what this family did in, in Dublin, Ireland, if we could do a fraction of that in Tyler, Texas, I think it's worth a shot to give back to our community and to be a positive light in a very, very dark world. Yeah, I think you're doing that too. And I told Ryan Friday, uh, we were sitting out there and making that video. And, and as he was talking, he made a couple of statements to me. And I said, would it be okay if I push back on you a little bit? Uh, just because it's easy to say, I told you at the beginning of the message, we all have our judgments, right? We all have our judgments. And you may be sitting here this morning going, well, I got some judgments against this guy. Cool. And so one, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> so I asked him, I said, Ryan, you know, how do you deal with people who really have an issue with drinking? They can't. And, and I've got some friends. They can't be anywhere near it. And I wouldn't practice my freedom at their expense. And so what do you say to those guys? And, and probably more of the conservative Bible belt of Tyler, Texas, East Texas. Here's this guy who's a Christian who started a brewery out of a small group, out of <laughs> church. And uh, Ryan, what do you do with that criticism I fully understand it, 100% um, understand it. You know, our, our goal is, is not to force something on someone or some people. Our goal is to bring some light to the reality of moderation and alcohol and the community aspect of what that can do. So if, if you struggle with, with alcohol or have struggled with alcohol, we don't What's your business? We really don't. We don't. We we'd no. love for you to come to True Vine, and I think you would um, really get to see the the whole vision and the mission of what we what we do there. But if that's a if that's a weakness or a struggle in your life, like it sometimes can be for all of us, um, don't do it. I don't want to 
put that on anybody. Um, Paul says, I become all things to all people so that I might win some. Yeah. And so with that, if that's not your thing, great, don't do it. Uh, we, we make good root beer and lemonade and sodas and um, that, that you could still come enjoy um, fellowship at, at Truvine. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah, I think so. You said something in the video, um, and honestly, when you first said it the other day on Friday, I don't know if you remember, I kind of went. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I kind of, I pushed back on him a little bit. That's good. And, <laughs> and here, here's what he said. It, it, we were sitting at the table talking, and he goes, I believe beer is the great, or can be, a great equalizer. And I went, oh, I don't know if I agree with that. And so I, after we had all this conversation, I said, okay, Ryan, you, if you say that in front of our church, there's going to be some people out there going, you mean I've got to drink beer just to be an equalizing force? And so I pushed back on him a little bit. And, and I said, what do you mean by that? Because very honestly, a Big Mac can be a great equalizer. There's better burgers out there, guys. Oh, the, I was trying to if, go safe, if, if okay? If you're going to do a cheeseburger, do a cheeseburger. I was trying to be safe, all right? So, uh, you know, I, I think, that, you know, you hear a statement like that, and I totally get where he's coming from, but immediately, man, I had a judgment. Immediately. And I knew when you heard that on the video, you might go, I don't agree because of your background. Because we're so, some of you were in an abusive alcoholic relationship, and you're like, it didn't equalize anything. It destroyed my life. Yeah. yeah. And I want to be sensitive to that. And so I pushed back on him a little bit. And I said, help, help them understand what you mean by that. And so I'm, I'm, I asked permission to push back on you the other day. Sure. And, and no surprises. I promise you there'd be no surprises. But kind of talk about what you meant by that, that beer being the great equalizer. Yeah. So, um, or a great. For me, yeah. So what we've been talking about this whole series is about all of these things that have been considered taboo, like yeah. we should not do this, do this, do this. Um, so when I, I was taught no, no, no alcohol, drugs, obviously, no sex before marriage, obviously, there's some great <laughs> wisdom in that. But then it started getting a little bit deeper and there's different things um, that I think were more of a gray subject that we need to def define. Um, the great leveler. Um, so he, he, Pastor Edward said, um, hold on a second, a cheeseburger is a great leveler too. And I believe that. Uh, for me, growing up in, a, in an era where there is no such, you do not do alcohol at all in public. <laughs> in public, um, that is not okay. Um, so for me, a beer is a great leveler for my generation and I believe your generation as well, because it was so taboo. And so if we take that taboo and put that in front of us and have a conversation without that behind us, I feel like we can have almost, hey, I trust you, you trust me, let's have a deep conversation. And it's just not me that said this either. So I did some of my, <laughs> some, some notes. St. Patrick um, was a, had a personal brewmaster um, there was a uh, considerable speculation of the great movement towards Christ um, in Ireland, and beer was a common draw. They used it as a leveler, mm. um, a tool for ministry in the pagan culture of Ireland. Um, and there's so much history behind um, John Calvin, Martin Luther, John Wesley, Charles Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, all of these guys, Charles Spurgeon, great men of faith whom we quote all the time, that was a real thing in their day. They enjoyed these things, of course, in moderation. There is right. nowhere in uh, church history or the Bible, which is obviously our, our skeleton, our theology, that condones drunkenness. Right. Um, there's, there's not. And so there's always um, a fine line there. And sometimes it's difficult to balance that fine line. And so if you can't balance the fine line, don't do it. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite things that Charles Spurgeon said in kind of regards to this, he was um, often judged because he was a cigar smoker. And um, I heard a story where a lady came up to him after uh, a message and said, when are you going to, why are you smoking cigars or 
something along these lines, uh, when is it too much? And he said, well, maybe when I'm smoking two at one time. Uh, <laughs> he, he, is, he was quoted saying that I shall go home and smoke the best cigar that I have to the glory of God. Mm. And I think that it's just very important for us to understand that anything, any beautiful That's gift it. that God has given us can be abused. perverted and yes. abused. We've yes. seen it over and over and over again. Um, I have a quick list, if you don't mind. Um, sex, it's a gift from God, right? In, in the confines of a healthy marriage. Yes. Um, but it can be perverted, it can be abused. It can be taken, something that can be taken for, that has been given for good can be taken and twisted for bad food. Hmm. Um, cheeseburgers. I love cheeseburgers. I think it's a gift from God that we yeah. can enjoy. <laughs> We have taste buds for a reason, right? He, he's given us those things, but if we abuse them, it's not good for our health. Yeah. Um, medications. Thank God for medications. Yeah. And um, people can abuse them and pervert them. Vehicles. We were talking about speeding earlier. Vehicles yeah. is a cool gift. I don't know about you guys, but I'm thankful that I get to get in a, a, a vehicle and drive down the road. And the faster the better. The faster the better. Amen. Yeah. Um, money. Is, is, a, is a tool, but if it's twisted and turned and perverted, it can be used for wrong. Coffee, I love coffee. Sleep and rest. God told us to sleep and rest. He gave us the, the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. But if you abuse it and pervert it and you lazy. have more rest, you turn into lazy. And so I think it's, it's a great opportunity um, for us to really evaluate all these gifts that have been given to us. They're there for us to enjoy. Um, however, there's boundaries. Yes. And so if we push the boundaries, if we're, if we're out of line, then we need to be corrected. Yeah. If I'm out of line, I need to be corrected. Um, and so I think that it's just important for us to understand that even around a beer, we can enjoy that in a proper way um, and have real community. Yeah, that's good. Um, you're values at True Vine really stood out to me. Uh, those, those three things, integrity, community, and love. And, and I told Ryan, I read an article uh, a couple of years ago, maybe it was a couple of years ago, I don't know, where an old guy came up to him there at their business and said, this feels like church. Mm. Talk about that. Very good. I, it, was, it was definitely an unreal moment. We have... Um, it, so True Vine now, we're five years old. Uh, we just moved to a new location about a year and a half ago. It has definitely been a blessing. It's been an, a very interesting uh, journey, the whole, the whole business, small business side of things. Um, but uh, we do these, we used to do these parties once a week or uh, once a month called Open Taps. And it was, you'd come, you'd get a glass and two beers, not three or four, but two beers. Uh, we'd have... Um, live music and food trucks and it was really neat a neat little gathering space and so we'd see people from all different backgrounds um, age groups coming together and enjoying fellowship which was amazing and one night after one of those open taps events uh, an older gentleman my, I've never seen before and I don't know if I've seen him since um, came up and said you know what this I, I don't know why I feel like I need to tell you this but this is exactly what church should be and I pondered on that a little bit afterwards. I said, thank you, very cool, I'm glad you guys came out. And I pondered on that afterwards and I started thinking about, what did he mean by that? This is what church should be. And the more that I come back to that um, and wrestled with it, I think that he felt comfortable. He felt yeah. like he could be himself. He felt like he could have uh, intentional conversations or just enjoy the gifts of music and food yeah. and beer in a safe environment, in a place where it was taboo to have a drink in front of people in a public place um, many years ago. Yeah. You know, most Baptists have what's called a beer fridge, and that's the one hidden in the garage, uh -huh. right? Yeah. So uh, I was a Baptist. Don't send me an email, okay? So, uh, Ron, I, I really appreciate you coming, and I think it's been cool um, to get to know you. I look forward to our friendship, and hopefully it'll grow and... and um, I love what you're doing. I love the balance, the tension that's there. I, I, you know, I think God gives us a whole lot more freedom than we give ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think there's a whole lot more freedom in Jesus. Uh, some of those things that we have been told were a sin, we need to bring out in front and redeem. Mm -hmm. 
And because uh, they're some of them are particular sins, some are universal sins, sure. but we're trying to hang some flesh around this. And I'm, I'm really proud of you, Thank come you. from your background. I pray that God will continue to bless you. I have one other question for you since you brought up all those lists. Yeah. Um, John Calvin's mm -hmm. uh, annual salary package included upwards of 250 gallons of wine. <laughs> were you willing to supply that here? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's on tape. Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming, dude. I appreciate you. Y'all give Ryan a hand. <laughs> before we wrap up, I, I want to I say this to you. I told you you'd probably never have heard anything like this before at church. And here's, here's what we want to do. We really want to be people who respond biblically. We want to know what God's word says. And see, here's what we know about God's word. And this is where it all kind of got goofy is that I don't think it takes very long for us to realize that the world is broken. Would you agree with that? Yes. There's brokenness everywhere. And mankind for years has been struggling with brokenness. Part of that brokenness is drunkenness. Part of that brokenness is uh, um, gluttony. Part of that brokenness is all these different things that even Ryan, that list, went through. And we try to, to fix those things because we, we, we're trying to come out here and think a new relationship will fix that or, or maybe a new church or a geographical location. And yet everything we try keeps leading back to brokenness. But that was not God's design because God's design was for you and I to be in relationship with him. But something happened in the garden that we know. And what happened in the garden is, is sin entered into the world. And with sin comes in, brokenness came a part of our journey. And we've tried all these different things. And you may be here this morning. You may be struggling with alcoholism. You may be struggling with, if I had interviewed the owner of Chick-fil-A, Chuck King, my good friend. You may struggle with overeating. And you would struggle with Chuck being up here just as much as you may struggle with a guy like Ryan being up here. Because, see, we all have our brokenness because sin entered into the world. And the reality is all have sinned and we're all running towards sin. And there's not a person in this room that's not been broken. And because of our brokenness, we're always looking for ways to correct that. But it always leads back to brokenness. And the only thing, because God's desire in the beginning was that you and I would be in relationship with him. So what he did was, is he did what only he could do. And he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross. And then three days later, to rise again. And the only thing that solves that brokenness is you and I to repent and believe on the name of Jesus Christ. And when we repent and believe on the name of Jesus Christ, let me tell you what happens. You and I, through the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you and I are then restored to the original plan through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Not going to church, not not drinking, not not chewing, not not smoking. All the things that continue to lead back to brokenness. And you just fill in the gap. The only thing that restores man is the lordship of Jesus Christ. That he died on the cross and three days later he rose again. So let me ask you a question as we close. And we're going to respond. Have you ever done that? You see, all the things that you may have been taught by your mama or your daddy or your denomination or however you grew up. Here's the answer. And listen, if you're struggling with alcoholism... A, 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 a recovery program alone is not going to save you if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a great start, but at some point, there is that surrendering and that death to self that we surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ so that we may be restored to the freedom that God created us to enjoy in him. And if you've never done that this morning, I want to invite you. In just a moment, I'm going to ask the band to come back. And they're, as they're coming back, I want to ask you this question. Have you ever surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? And if not, I want to invite you in just a moment. I'm going to pray as the band uh, is going to play this morning. I'm going to ask you to come and grab one of these elders or these prayer team members that are going to be across the front. And just say, you know what? I have never repented and believed on the name of Jesus Christ. This is salvation. Not going to church, not being good, not doing all the right. Salvation is in Jesus Christ alone. And if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to do that this morning. Maybe this morning you're struggling. 
And maybe you need one of these guys to pray over you this morning. And maybe alcoholism is not your sin. Maybe it's something. May, Ryan mentioned prescription drugs, one of the most silent addiction in our culture today that's abused. And nobody talks about it. So whatever your addiction is, whatever your struggle is, we want to invite you for prayer this morning. And then to respond with communion, we have two tables at the front, two in the back, that you would respond today what you've heard, maybe through this or what Ryan has said this morning, that we'd respond this morning. Amen? Let's, let me pray for you. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for Ryan and his journey and for his family, Lord. I pray that... Um, you would just continue to bless them. And Father, you would continue to use them. God, I thank you that they're bridging a gap with a whole group of people that I think the church, for many, have just rejected. And so, God, I pray for an anointing on his business. That, God, that when people walk onto the grounds of true vine, by the way, Father, your name, you are the true vine. That, God, there would be an anointing on that place. And God, you would protect him from all the trappings of any business of abuse and excess. Protect his family and his marriage and his kids. Lord, thank you for men like Ryan who's willing just to take that step in the middle of a very religious culture to follow your call. Lord, I pray for the one this morning that they're struggling, they're broken. They know they're broken. They've never surrendered their life to you. Father, would you give them courage today to step out just from right where they are, that they would step out in just a moment when we stand and everybody moves and goes and takes communion like the safe place that they can come and grab one of these prayer team members, one of these elders, and just say, I need Jesus. I'm broken. I need to be saved. Would you do that this morning, Father? And Lord, as we take communion, we worship you. We long for your return, that we get to be with you and worship you. Father, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this morning. We ask it in his beautiful name. And everybody said. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.